Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Got the door here. So, who has a comment and or question and or a conundrum of some kind, a dilemma, tragedy, catastrophe, or such and so that you want to discuss? Mr. Dale. This weekend I read and got caught up in my newspaper reading. Mm -hmm. And I believe it's Wednesday edition. The guy writing in a religious column almost every week, I don't remember his name. And he's talking about uh, Catholics and mm -hmm. the problem in one church. Yes, a pastor in California, but he used to be in Phoenix. Mm -hmm. And the controversy I guess they have is between I baptize or we baptize. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I don't know mm -hmm. if you saw that or not. Yeah, 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 yeah. I read, up, read, read on that quite a bit. What is our standing on something like that? Mm -hmm. It was just the word we versus I. Yeah. Nothing saw it for 40 years. Yeah. Well, um, first of all, when you have a formula, um, a traditional wording of something, a prayer, a piece of the liturgy, for example, and especially as far as the sacraments are concerned, um, it is held, has always been held in the church from ancient times that um, once you have a formula, okay, which is a set of words that everybody agrees on and everybody decides to use, and everybody also agrees that they mean the same thing. Once you have that formula, whether it's the words of the Agnus Dei, or the words of consecration, or the words of baptism, or whatever. Once you have that formula, it is generally agreed that you should not change it from place to place, from era to era, from year to year, from person to person. And when you do, that is called... Farcing, to farce the text, is to embellish with your own thoughts or to change for whatever reason you think you need to, all right? Uh, I'll give you a really good example. Um, at the end of the sermon, we have what's called the votum, you know, may the peace of God now guard your hearts and minds in your Lord Jesus Christ, words to that effect, okay, um, goes beyond all understanding, okay. Uh, people in my era like to change up that stuff. And uh, I remember one guy saying uh, uh, that goes beyond our human understanding. And a professor at the seminary uh, uh, objected rather vehemently and said, so you're telling me that the angels understand God's essence. You couldn't say that. Maybe they do, maybe they don't, but you can't say that because the Bible doesn't say that. And so the guy said, uh, uh, let's not be doing that. If you're going to quote the Bible, quote the Bible. If you're going to quote a formula, quote a formula. Don't mess around with it. You, you do not have the right. It's the property of the whole church. And, and by that, we mean the entire church, all believers. And as we know, there are believers in the Roman church, there are believers in the Methodist church, Presbyterian church. Uh, may, not, may not be a whole lot, but they're there. Okay. So uh, as one uh, professor put it in our class, there shall be no forcing in this class. Got a chuckle out of everybody. Okay, so, so that's, that's the first thing. Guys, pastors, priests, people do this to be different sometimes, 
to think that they've got an improvement, uh, to think that there's, their wording is better or whatever. And 99 and a half times out of 100, it's not. Uh, it, it, it may be seem better for that particular time and place, but in general, it's not. Okay, so change for change's sake or change is never good. Okay, all right. So that's, that's the first point. Shouldn't do it. Just shouldn't do it. It's, it's not a good idea. And if you're going to do it, everybody ought to be on the same page. We're all going to change it. Let's all change it. Okay? And of course, nowadays, with all the thousands of denominations, it's not likely <laughs> that we're going to get anybody to agree on a change like that. All right? So that's the first point. Okay? Uh, the second point is that uh, Roman doctrine... Uh, concerning the priesthood, is that uh, the priest always stands in place of Christ. Okay? As Christ, you might even say. Christ on earth, just like the Pope is the vicar of Christ on earth. Okay? So the Roman priest, when the Roman priest consecrates the elements, all right, it is Christ doing that according to Roman doctrine, not the priest. It is Christ's words, it is the priest's words, and the priest's character that's been given to him by Christ in his ordination and the laying on of hands. All right? Ordination, as you remember, in the Roman church is a sacrament. Okay? It changes the character of the priest to be holy and to represent Christ. This is why the uh, sexual scandals in the priesthood of the Roman church are so uh, upsetting uh, to the lay people because the lay people are told that the priests stand in place of Christ. And so the, we don't, the Protestants don't get it, you know. We look at this and we go, yeah, there's always been pastors that are fooling around on the side, you know, or got their hand in the cookie jar, or, you know, but who, who cares? What difference does it make? Well, to the Protestants, it don't make a whole lot of difference. And especially as Lutherans, we believe that the devil himself can consecrate the elements and we still have the real presence and we still have an a accurate and correct sacrament. Okay? Romans don't teach that. Okay? Romans teach that you've got to have the indelible character of Christ bestowed upon you by ordination and the laying on of hands in order to carry out that magic, really, in changing the body and blood, transubstantiation into bread and wine, or uh, bread and wine into body and blood, okay? So th this, is, this is much more serious, see, much more serious than, than we think. We, we don't, like I said, we don't get it, all right? So because the priest is standing in the place of Christ, obviously he needs to say, or they believe he needs to say, I. I, Jesus, baptize you. That is very important to the essence of their sacrament, that Jesus is actually doing the sacrament. Jesus, when, when the priest says, I pronounce you husband and wife, it is in Roman theology, Jesus Christ himself who is declaring that marriage. This is why marriage cannot be easily broken in the Roman church. Okay? See, and, and again, this is something the Protestants, eh, you know, you know, you don't know, think this way, okay? All seven of the sacraments in the Roman church, okay, are uh, the, an essential part of those seven sacraments is this point. It, it, you, you, you just, you don't understand, folks, that this is big stuff. This is huge. This is an essential element of the sacrament. This is why lay people cannot consecrate elements. Uh, lay people must take, for example, if you're going to be a deacon in the Roman church and, and share the Lord's Supper with somebody shut in or somebody, uh, you have to take already consecrated bread and wine. Okay? And this is why they believe that the bread and wine stays body and blood in, indefinitely. Okay? Because, again, of this business. Okay? I, Jesus Christ... Okay, that's who's talking here, even though the priest is saying the words. Okay, you gotta understand that. Otherwise, you don't want to, this is not gonna make any sense to you. Okay? So, when 
then this guy, and, and he wasn't alone. We find out now that this has been done all over the place. There's a case uh, I read about in Michigan, one in Illinois, uh, various different parishes around the country, the East Coast in, in Maryland and New York and places. Uh, it turns out that this was kind of a, a fad for a while. And a lot of guys who, who came, out of in, uh, came out of seminary about the same time I did, you know, in, in those uh, uh, 70s and 80s, um, seemed to have this predilection, you know, to do a lot of farcing. Okay, uh, and and uh, so uh, one of this is one of the things that one of the things they did, and so now that it's been kind of discovered, now that the bishops and the and the archbishops and the cardinals and everybody have got got wind of this, now they're of course upset, because they say, well, because this now calls into question uh, the uh, the entire uh, sacrament. Is it is since since this is the approved sacramental formula. I baptize you in the name of God, Father, and God, the Son, and God, and the Holy Spirit. Okay? That's the approved. That's everybody's approved it. Everybody's used it since 300 AD. Maybe, well, probably all, we know that before that. Okay? This is not approved. Okay? This has not been approved. Nobody's ever approved this. No church council, no pope, no nobody has ever said you can do that. And so the question is, does this invalidate the sacrament? Now, in Roman theology, that's a legitimate question. In Lutheran theology, biblical theology, it's not. But in Roman theology, that's a legitimate question. They, they, they are upset about this. Okay? Now, you have to understand one more thing. Okay? Uh, baptism is, a, is the, in the Roman church, is the right of initiation. All other sacraments are built on this. Okay? This makes you a Christian. Right? So, here's the other problem. In Roman theology, if you're not a Christian after your baptism, then your first communion is no good. Your confirmation is no good. Your marriage is no good. Your ordination is no good if you become a, a, a priest. Your last rites are no good. And your funeral mass is no good. None of them account for anything because you're not a Christian because this is unapproved. Yeah, whoa, <laughs> okay, big time whoa. And again, you don't read this in most of the articles, news or newspaper articles, but that's what it means. And if you look at the new, uh, Catholic newspapers and, and the Catholic magazines, the Roman magazines, this is what they're saying. They're, they're, they're really torn up about this. I mean, this is calling into question. I mean, we're talking tens of thousands of sacraments and tens of thousands of people, okay? For, for 50 years, in some cases. This is, this is a disaster to them. Big time disaster. So this is why this is so important. Okay? Again, if you're not a Christian, you can't take... Even the most liberal Romans, you know, Father Greg, he's, he's, pretty, he's pretty progressive here in town. But even Father Greg will say, if you're not a Christian, you can't take Lord's Supper here. You can't, take, you can't participate in the Mass. He will say that. He will tell people that. Okay? Even though Romans today will commune Episcopalians, Methodists, Presbyterians, a bunch of other people, okay, they still say, if you're not a Christian, you would be taking this to your detriment, your spiritual detriment. And so if your baptism... If your baptism was invalid, then you're not a Christian. See? Huge, giant. Well, I, I think again, because these guys, just like our pastors, I mean, you know, we had a pastor, I'll give you an example in the wells. 
We had a pastor up in uh, Northern California, a suburb of uh, San Francisco. I can't remember the town, uh, but uh, he was a pastor up there, uh, and uh, he got it in his head that it would be really neat and really progressive and really fun and, and, and really encourage his congregation to have women uh, reading the Bible lessons during the worship service. Okay? And, and so he, he, he got, well, first he started out just, well, let's have lay people do it. You know, how come the pastor is the only one that can read the Bible in church? Well, of course, I don't know. He didn't know. He wasn't the brightest bulb, you know, in the pack at seminary. You know, he was like graduated whew, down at the bottom of the class. He was not in my class. He was a class ahead of me, but not real bright. Uh, not, to, not a theologian, in other words. Uh, Anyway, so when, when, they, when his congregation, who was made up of a lot of progressives there around San Francisco, uh, and, and they pushed him on this, you know, he said, well, okay, okay, all right. And then, of course, he said, well, right, let's get up a list of people who, who, who want to uh, uh, read Scripture in, in service. And so the next thing, of course, absolutely, the next thing, a week later, somebody raised their hand and said, how come women can't participate in this? Well, I don't know. You, know, you didn't know. And again, you didn't think about it. Okay, so he put them in the list, all right? Well, somebody visited the church, reported it to the district president. District president got his nose out of a joint, uh, you know, and then uh, uh, other pastors uh, chimed in. Uh, this particular pastor from Sierra Vista got all upset uh, and, uh, and uh, talked to a number of people and put it out there for everybody to see and uh, brought it up at a district convention. And uh, the district presidents then met uh, together, formulated a nice little piece of uh, doctrine or paper, practice, whatever you want to call it, put it out there and said, this should stop immediately. And, and he was told, and he stood up and he said, well, what am I going to do? My congregation is used to this. They, they like this. What am I going to do? And the guy said, well, you can either stop it or you can be replaced. Well, okay. You know. Um, so anyway, uh, uh, pastors do this, and and uh, 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 I, I've been I've been criticized. I've been criticized. Okay. You, you know, I know that's shocking. You can imagine it. All right. But but you know, uh, uh, people people say uh, Pastor Spencer is communing. You know, seven and eight year olds and nine year olds. Uh, uh, you know, that's that's wrong. You shouldn't do that. Uh, uh, Pastor Spencer is uh, uh, all by himself just decided to have communion every Sunday. Uh, and that's different than all other Wells churches. Uh, Pastor Spencer is using 1941 liturgy. Uh, nobody else is using it. Uh, Pastor Spencer is doing ashes on Ash Wednesday. Nobody else is doing that. Um, Pastor Spencer is doing private confession. Nobody else is doing that. Uh, blah, 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 you know. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, I've, I've criticized a lot. You know, and, and, and my, my argument is always real simple. My argument is, this is the way it was in the apostolic church 1,500, 1,700, 1,800 years ago. And so I'm not doing anything new. <laughs> I'm just going back to the original. Nothing wrong with that, okay? Going back to the original. That's all I'm doing, okay? And so people drop the argument and, you know, and also, being down here in the armpit of the uh, uh, United States, uh, it doesn't happen very often that people come across it. You know, once in a long while, we'll get a, a, a vacationing Wells pastor come through. I remember a couple years ago, a Wells pastor came through. It was summertime, and he and his wife were in an RV, and they were traveling around, and, and they decided to go see Tombstone or whatever, and they came to church here on Sunday. And it was two pastors, as a matter of fact, two, uh, a couple, uh, two couples, uh, and they joined together to rent this RV. Anyway, uh, and they came to church one morning, and on the way out, they both said the same thing. Man, if I wouldn't know better, I wouldn't even think this was a Wells church. You're really out there, Spence. You're really, man, you know. Um, so it doesn't happen very often. But, uh, uh, again, uh, it seemed to be that the guys uh, 40, 30, maybe even 20 years ago, this was, this was kind of a popular thing to do. You know, and it's like it's kind of like in the ELCA uh, years ago when people decided, oh, let's let's do something different. I baptize you in the name of God the Mother and God the Daughter and God the Holy Spook or you know whatever. Okay, just just for fun, right? Uh, they they feel like they can do that kind of stuff, and and if nobody calls them on it, they just keep doing it. 
And so I think that's why it took so long, is that this was being done and nobody thought anything of it until somebody, and I have no idea who it was, but somebody raised a stink and said to their bishop or somebody that, hey, uh, should we be doing this? And that's all it takes usually is somebody to, you know, hey, uh, get somebody's attention and, and, and you know, bring this up. But, but these are the three points that you don't see very often uh, in this discussion. Most of the time you see discussion and, and the newspaper articles and whatever, religious writers even, will go, I don't see the point. What's the point here? This is stupid. Well, yeah, okay, it is stupid. <laughs> okay, according to the Bible, it doesn't matter. I mean, uh, you can say uh, we, you can say us, you can say I, you can say you, you can say, you can say anything you want to say. Okay, the important part is the word baptize, okay, uh, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, obviously, and applying water. That's what's important. The rest, the rest of the formula is, I mean, I'm not saying it's not important, but it's not essential. Okay? So the essential elements okay, are the Trinity and water and baptize what you're doing. That's, that's, those are the essential. That's what Jesus said, go and baptize. I mean, when you think of it, the word I is not in that formula, is it? It's not in there. Go and baptize all nations. Teaching them all things, right? It's not in there. The word I is not in there. And as far as we know, for sure that is, we don't know that Jesus baptized anybody. Depending on how you read a couple of passages in the Gospels, Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. It's like Paul. You know, Paul says, well, I'm glad I never baptized anybody. Well, that's not exactly true. He did baptize people. But who he's writing to at that particular place, as far as we know, he didn't baptize anybody. And then he says, except for <laughs> one or two, one or two, please, you know. In other words, this wasn't, a, this wasn't Paul's a practice. His, his practice was to preach the gospel and leave the baptizing and the other uh, par parish activities to a local uh, the local minister, the local pastor, okay? But once in a while, Peter, Paul, the rest of them would do some baptizing, but normally they were evangelists, not pastors per se, that is local parish pastors, okay? All right, does that answer everybody's questions? I saw a hand back there. Bruce? Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now it, it, that brings up that that brings up a fair question. We still have five minutes. Uh, that brings up a fair question. Um, it, it, as my my wife sarcastically said. Uh, the other day, well, it's not like women don't know how to read. Because this issue had come up somewhere as another uh, newspaper article or something. And um, I said, that's not the point. That's not the point. Uh, in my ordination vows and in my installation vows, uh, of, as installed in this congregation, I am responsible for worship, all worship. Okay? Uh, that's my job. Right? Uh, I have no right uh, and no excuse to turn it over to somebody else. Right? Uh, this is being, of course, watered down quite a bit in the wells, and in Missouri too, of course. Um, in the wells, for example, nowadays, we have ministers of worship, that's what they're called, or staff ministers, ministers of worship who are women, and they take care of all the worship. They pick the hymns, they pick the readings. Uh, they don't do the readings because of the DOP, the COP, uh, Council of Presidents uh, paper of a while back, but they pick the readings. They, 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 they pick the hymns, they pick the readings, they pick the liturgy if, if there is one. Um, um, they, they instruct the choir. Uh, you know, sometimes they even pick the pericope, that is the series of sermons, uh, uh, and, and stuff like that. 
and they'll pick the theme of the day, and so on and so forth. And so uh, a lot of pastors love it because the and and it's funny we have only graduated probably half a dozen of these ministers of worship from our staff minister college in uh, um, in New Ulm and and the one in um, in uh, Waukesha Waukesha I think it's Waukesha Wabatosa thank you um, and and maybe half a dozen maybe a few more. Uh, and every single one of them are women. Every single one of them are women. Uh, we have no men in the staff minister program to become ministers of worship for some reason. I, I don't know why, but that's it. And so we have half a dozen or, or more of our churches now uh, who all the worship is being run for all intents and purposes uh, 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 by women who are not really supposed to have that kind of authority in the church according to Scripture. Uh, but I've bring, I brought this up to the Senate President personally. I brought this up to district presidents personally. And uh, the, their attitude is, don't rock the boat. If they're not out in front leading, don't rock the boat. Don't. It's okay. As long as they're not out front. Okay. I think that's splitting hairs, frankly. I really do. I think that's splitting hairs. Authority is authority is authority. And if you're the authority for picking how the congregation worships, then you're leading in worship. I mean, I don't see how else you, I don't see how you can say it any other way. So it, it's not that women can't read. It's that standing in the pulpit, and I don't do it uh, very much. I mean, I do a little bit of it. Maybe I emphasize a word here and there, or I maybe... Uh, you'll see I'll stop and I'll say, you know, instead of he, I'll say Jesus. Or every once in a while, I will say, you know, in where Zion, I'll say this is the church or, or whatever. If I think it's really important, you know, it used to be when I was first in the ministry, uh, we were told, as a matter, we were taught, as a matter of fact, to explain the, 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 the readings before you read them. Well, I know in my case, and I know in many other uh, my classmates' cases, uh, some of these things got to be many sermons. And sometimes the explanation of the reading was longer than the reading. And uh, an old guy, a matter of fact, it was a, a Missouri Synod guy uh, who joined our congregation in El Paso, uh, first year or two I was there, uh, on the way out one day, uh, he said to me, uh, he said, uh, um, is God's word sufficient or not? And I said, oh, it's sufficient. In other words, uh, what, what God says can be understood by people. I said, yeah. And, and the Holy Spirit uses it as he sees fit. I said, yeah. I said, then why are you explaining it? If it, It's not a sermon, which is, it's not really explaining the text, as, as you know. Uh, it, it's more like taking the text and kind of running with it, you know, expounding the whole issue that, that, that maybe the text talks about. Um, and, 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 you know, it got me to thinking. And I brought it up to some uh, other pastors, and, and they all said, well, uh, the people don't understand. I said, really? Uh, I can see that sometimes. Yeah, I can see some Old Testament readings uh, or, or you know, some old prophecies or, or something maybe out of uh, Moses' uh, ceremonial law that people may go, eh, eh, what's that all about? Uh, but, but as I have explained to you before, Two reasons why I don't do the explanation. One is so they will ask me, okay, personally, either on the phone or come by my office or nowadays email, and I can answer and, and, and therefore have some good contact with my sheep, right? Uh, and, and the other reason is maybe they'll come to Bible class and raise their hand. And I've said to you many, many times, you know, when you come here uh, Sunday morning, the first half hour, one of the questions you can ask is, what was that reading all about last week? And if we had Bible class after worship, which I had in El Paso and in, and in uh, Broadhead in, in Wisconsin, uh, if we had, then, then of course that would be more, uh, I, I would even ask, I would be very, very specific. Does everybody understand the readings today? Did everybody get that, what, what we're talking about? And then I would, again, have an opportunity to, to, to have rapport, if you will, with my sheep. So that's why I do it. And, and also because God's Word is God's Word. And, and the Holy Spirit will make wise to you what God is trying to say to you. 
you, you don't need, you don't need my, you don't need my farcing <laughs> additions, you know, always. I mean, once in a while, okay, maybe it's a, maybe it's a good thing, just, just so everybody, oh, okay, uh, we know what the situation is. But nine times out of ten, it's not really necessary at all. And even if it were necessary, I still wouldn't do it because, again, I want, to, I want that rapport with, with people. I want people to come to me and ask, what was Paul talking about? What was Moses talking about? What was Jeremiah talking about? But I don't understand what David had to say. It didn't make sense to me. Good, let me explain it to you. That's my job, again. That's my job. Okay? All right, let's move on. Let's uh, get going on this uh, Anglican thing. And... Uh, uh -huh. First comment. I think what you said is exactly right there. And a lot of people just go and ask somebody else. It's like asking you, a plumber, can you fix my car? <laughs> right, yeah. By just asking somebody else, especially when both of them have to become questions. Yeah, yeah. Page 152. Now we get a little bit of the story, I think, is important part of the reason why God allowed uh, the Anglican church to be formed. You know, people will wonder, why did God allow this? Why did God have Henry uh, do what he did? Uh, why did uh, uh, Edward have to die? Why did uh, Mary... Uh, why was Mary such a fanatic? And why was Elizabeth such a compromiser? Uh, all of it, for good and ill, some good things, some bad things, but all of it led to this, what we're going to talk about now, which I think really we can say as Christians in our world today, probably the most important development in Christianity uh, since the Reformation, certainly, uh, maybe since Pentecost. And that's the revised or the uh, authorized uh, version of the Bible, what we know as the King James Bible. Shortly after coming to the throne, James I, son of Mary Stuart, uh, that's uh, Mary, Queen of Scots, by the way, that's the one who lost her head to Elizabeth, uh, who was again a devout Roman and would not have supported this had she lived attempted to bring unity to the Church of England by instituting a commission consisting of scholars from all views within the church to produce a unified and new translation of the Bible free of both Calvinist and Roman influence. So it wasn't going to be a Calvinist Bible. It wasn't going to be a Roman Bible. It was going to be, frankly, a Lutheran Bible, although they didn't really know it at the time. A lot of these guys who, put, who did work on the King James were closet Lutherans. Uh, they, had, they had supported Luther's Reformation. Uh, uh, they had supported many of the goals of the Reformation and many of the doctrines that Luther came up with. Uh, and uh, if they weren't 100% Book of Concord people, they were pretty close. The project began in 1604 and uh, was completed in 1611 and be, becoming the de facto authorized version of the Bible in the Church of England and Anglican churches throughout the communion until the mid 20th century, until really the Second World War. Uh, after the Second World War, then we have a proliferation of translations. We had a few before that. We had translations started coming out in the 1880s some even earlier than that, but the 1880s was kind of a, a watershed time when, the, when translations were being done. Um, but, but it really wasn't until after the Second World War that translations really took off, and that we had nowadays, I think, 100, 100 plus translations of English translations, much less other ones. You have to understand something, too. Um, the Romans realized the Romans realized that the reason that Luther did what he did, the reason he came up with what he came up with, was because he and others had full access to Scripture, and he was trained, of course, in Greek and Hebrew, and so he didn't have to read Jerome's Vulgate, which was the 
only Bible authorized in the Roman Church uh, for a long, long time, uh, even up to this time too. But but uh, uh, Jerome's Vulgate was a good translation for you know it it, it had a few problems here and there, uh, but Jerome himself spoke Hebrew. Uh, his Greek wasn't real great, but his Hebrew was terrific. He, he was he was an expert in Hebrew. And so his Old Testament was wonderful, and I don't know that you can complain about anything about his Old Testament, but his New Testament eh, left a little bit to be desired. Anyway, um, it's because Luther could read the original Hebrew and Greek, and it's because a text came out at the time by Erasmus, which is now re recalled or, or called the, uh, um, the received text, or textus receptus, uh, that he was able to prove and able to to uh, uh, come up with and prove his teachings. Salvation by grace alone through faith and so on and so forth. Okay? The Romans realized this. And the Romans realized that if everybody had the Bible, if every Tom, Dick, and Harry had a Bible, and every Tom, Dick, and Harry could just read the Bible in their own language and, and go to their priest and say, Hey, what about this? You know, what about this? Uh, uh, by works no man will be justified. Well, what is that? Oh, you explain that to me. Uh, they knew they would be in trouble, big trouble. And so two things they forbid. They forbid translations to be made, and they forbid people to actually have and read on their own the Bible. And that was true for a long, 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 long time in the Roman church. Long time in the Roman church. Yes, ma'am. It's, it's uh, also in today's church, well, Twenty years, thirty years ago, uh, this was raised there. Mm -hmm. They had a beautiful family box, and I touched it and looked at it. My sister in law, who now had a cow, what are you doing? I said, I was going to read. We don't do that. Right. It just sits there. Mm -hmm. So I asked him, Have you ever really read it? We're not allowed to. Yeah. No, they were told. I, I, I'm uh, not that old, and, and I remember very distinctly. Uh, going to work one day, a um, uh, well, summer, uh, my, my work on the ranch, and I worked with a guy by the name of Don Rinaldo, and Don Rinaldo was in his, at uh, that time, he was in his late 60s. Um, he had his sons work for us too. But anyway, uh, we would sit and talk theology at work, at, at lunch. And uh, Don Rinaldo, uh, one time, and my Spanish was much better in those days, and his English was pretty good, so we could understand each other pretty well. And he complained, he said, we got a new priest in our parish down in San Luis. And well, I, don't, I don't like him. I don't like him at all. I said, where's he from? Uh, he's from Ireland. <laughs> and I don't like him. Why don't you like him? Three reasons. First, he allowed the men and women to sit together in church. That was not done in Mexico. The men sat on one side, the women on the other, or the men sat in the front and the women sat in the back. Okay? And he did not like the fact that this new Irish priest came to this Mexican parish in San Luis, Rio, Colorado, and, and uh, right away said, oh, that's okay, you can, you know, my husband's wife's going to make can sit together. Ooh, everybody went crazy. Okay. The second thing that, uh, that he did, I can't remember the third one, but the second thing he said that really bothered him was he told the people uh, if they wanted to have Bible classes in their homes or, or study the Bible uh, on their own, they could do that. Oh, oh. And, and he was, and, and, and Dominaldo was just flabbergasted. Just absolutely flabbergasted. What is he, he, you know, he wants us all to become pagans like you, Spence. You know, Lutheranos, you know. Uh, uh, and and uh, I, I will say something, though. I, I will say that, that I can understand Dominaldo's problem. Oh, by the way, you know what they did with him? Uh, they complained to the bishop, they complained to the Monsignor, they complained to various other people, nothing was done. And so one night, Don Ronaldo and his sons and a couple other people took a pickup truck, they drove up to the parish house, that's where all the priests live, and there was a big parish, so it was four or five guys in there. Drove up to the parish house, found this Irish priest, tied him up, tied him, had the hand and feet, put tape around his mouth, threw him in the back of the pickup truck, and drove to, uh, I think, at Hermosillo. I think drove to Hermosillo, where the uh, archbishop was, and rolled him out of the back of the truck onto the front steps of the archbishop's place. 
with a note attached in Spanish saying, don't send him back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, and I kind of understand why they were that way. Because almost immediately after this trend took off, and it did, regardless of what they did with this priest, after the trend took off of, of Bible studies and all kinds of stuff like this, uh, that parish uh, lost a lot of people, and a lot of uh, the Mexicans up there uh, became uh, charismatic, Pentecostals. And Church of Christ, uh, Assemblies of God, uh, Nazarene made huge inroads into the uh, Roman parishes in northern Mexico. And, and, and you know, it, that was bad enough because it, it, it disrupted the unity of, of the area. But, you know, what was really bad about it was the new charismatic Pentecostal types, the new Reformed uh, Christians, okay, then began to refer to the Roman Christians, including their parents, their children, their aunts and uncles, cousins, you know, as idol worshipers. Yeah, because of Mary, the saints, and, and all the statues and all that kind of stuff. And the Roman people began to refer to their cousins and nephews and other uncles and mothers and fathers and children who were Pentecostal charismatic as pagans. And it did horrible things to many families. I knew many of these people. I worked with them on the ranch. And, and it just tore families totally apart. You know, quinceañeras were labeled as, you know, a heathen. Uh, uh, mass was, was taught as being, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 pagan sacrifice or whatever, idol sacrifice. Uh, I mean, it was, it was horrible. It was horrible. The names they called each other, the vehement, the vitriol aimed at either side. And these charismatic Pentecostals became absolute fanatics. And the Romans, they became absolute fanatics. And it was horrible. It was religious wars all over again. And so I kind of understand why Ernesto and Guillermo and Don Bernaldo and the rest of them felt the way they did, because they, they knew this was going to happen. And, and while, you know, I obviously don't agree with Roman doctrine on a lot of things, I also don't agree with Pentecostal charismatic doctrine on a lot of things. And so it, it's, in many cases, it's like these people jump from the frying pan into the fire. <laughs> okay? they, they went the wrong direction. And, and by the way, they skipped over Lutheran completely. They skipped over Lutheran completely. They, you know, they became Protestant, but they, they just went, went way beyond Luther and went to Calvin and Arminius and, and the other radical uh, 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 Protestants, radical reformers. And, and I, I think I know why. Lutheranism did not appeal, and this is still true. Uh, in uh, our missionaries in Mexico and South America, it's still true. We, we just have a horrible time. Man, you know, the Baptists go down there and they fill up a church quick. And the Charismatics and Pentecostals, man, the Assemblies of God, I mean, if they're growing, or were up till recently, uh, they're growing like, like crazy in Latin America, all Latin America, from here to Antarctica. Okay? Lutheran soul, just, you know, uh, it, we, we don't appeal. We, there, there's nothing, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot for them, okay? There, there's, no, there's no saints, there's no Mary, there's no, uh, you know, and, and especially in Wisconsin, you know, we, we play down uh, uh, sacraments, unfortunately. Uh, you know, imagine, imagine if you're, uh, you're Mexican, you come over here to the United States, you, you immigrate legally, let's say, and everything, and you, you're living in El Paso, okay? I saw this happen. You're living in El Paso, uh, and you're, you're studying the scripture, and all of a sudden you decide, I want to become a Lutheran, okay? And so all your life, all your life, uh, you have, your, your whole life has been focused on sacraments and, and, and all that, and, and mass every Sunday and, and everything, you know, that, that's been your life, okay? And confession, absolution, you know, that's been your life. And you, and you come over to our mission there in uh, the barrio in El Paso on the south side uh, near the border, uh, and all of a sudden, communion once a month. No confession, absolution. 
Uh, baptism is rudimentary. Throw some water, boom, say a few things. No oil, no salt, no, you know what I mean? No, you know. That's it. And, and so a lot of them would come and they would visit and they would start even the instruction class and then we'd lose them. Either go back to Rome or they would go on to something where there's, you know, hallelujah, praise the Lord, you know, there's, there's something, you know, there's, there's meat to them anyway. There's meat there, all right? There's, there, there's something in the practice, the everyday, every Sunday practice that they can put their oomph into, right? And I've tried to tell our missionaries this over and over and over and over and over again. They don't listen to me because my Spanish is lousy. I say, what do you know, Spence? I said, only, I only grew up a rock's throw from the border. Come on. And I worked with these people every year of my life since I was eight years old. I know, I know what they're looking for. And you guys don't got it. And every one of our Hispanic missions, folks, every single one of our Hispanic missions in the wells has died. Every single one. There's only one left in Maryvale, uh, in Phoenix area, that's limping along. But all the rest of them are either dead or about to be dead. And that should tell you something. Even the Missouri Senate is better. Some of their missions in Missouri Senate down in El Paso are thriving. They're full of people. Why? Because they have communion every Sunday. They have private confession. Okay? They have icons. They have statues. Okay? They, they give the people something. Okay, maybe they have mariachi liturgy once in a while. Which, uh, that's kind of crazy. But, you know, they do quinceaneras. Okay? I did a couple quinceaneras for, for my people in, in El Paso. And what's wrong with that? There's nothing, nothing wrong with that. It's not, it's not Roman. It's more cultural Hispanic than it is Roman. They don't do quinceañeras in Italy, I don't think, or Spain, well, maybe Spain, but not Italy or France or places like that. Okay, maybe. Anyway, so you have to understand what's going on here is, is that all kinds of Protestants are coming up with their own translation. By the time you've got King James deciding to have a committee and come up with one, there's like 10 English translations out there. Some of them are really lousy, <laughs> okay? Some of them are really bad, okay? I'm sorry, I kind of got off the subject there. Anyway, let's go on. The New Testament was translated from the Textus Receptus, or Received Text, edition of the Greek text, so-called because most extant texts of the time were in agreement with it. That is, all the manuscripts that they had at that time agreed with this uh, single text. The Old Testament was translated from the Masoretic Hebrew text, while the Apocrypha was translated from the Greek Septuagint. So we had three main texts. The Masoretic text, which was put together by the Jews between 6 and 800, uh, uh, AD. Um, this was a long time, of course, after the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, and so the Masoretic text uh, is the best thing we have, the closest thing we have to the Hebrew text. And when the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, interestingly enough, it matched the Masoretic text almost uh, uh, period for period, you know, uh, letter for letter. The work was done by 47 scholars working in six committees, two based at each of the University of Oxford, Cambridge, and Westminster. Pretty good lineage there, huh? They worked on certain parts separately, and then drafts produced by each committee were compared and revised for harmony with each other. Good way to do translation. Divide it up, have people work in committees, have even the committees work, the members work individually, bring together, look at, have the committee look at it, have everybody agree on it, bring all the committees together, have everybody look at everything and agree on everything. Everybody's on the same page. And these 47 people, some of them had Roman leanings, some of them had Calvin leanings, some of them had Armenian leanings, some of them, like I say, had Lutheran leanings. So just about every, at the time, every color, if you will, of Christianity was uh, addressed in, or represented in this committee. This translation was a profound effect on English literature. The works of famous authors such as William Shakespeare, John Milton, Herman Melville, John Dryden, William Wordsworth, John Bunyan are deeply inspired by it. That's what they quote. Anybody who's writing anything in English between 1611 and about 1850, uh, maybe 1875, is going to quote King James. Nothing else. That's it. 
And, and there were other translations, like I say, there were other translations around. But that's the only one that made it. The rest of them, they, they all, they, they all fell, up, fell out on the wayside of interim. Nobody read them. The authorized version is often referred to as the King James Version, particularly in the United States. This is in spite of the fact that King James was not personally involved in the translation, though his authorization was legally necessary for the translation to begin. And he set out guidelines for the translation process, such as prohibiting footnotes and ensuring that Anglican portions, uh, positions were recognized on various points. So he insisted that it not, at least not counter Anglican doctrine. Didn't necessarily have to support it, but it couldn't counter it. And when he when he said no footnotes, that was a very wise thing to do, because you know with footnotes you can completely change what you said in the text. <laughs> and this was common. This was common in the day. And so when King James said, "Okay, fine, get out of translation," no, 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 no footnotes. What's in the translation is in the translation. Just leave. It, it, it's, it's almost the same as, as, as uh, me not explaining scripture readings. Okay? It, it, it's just let God talk. Let God talk. Leave the Holy Spirit to do the work. And James was not necessarily, I would say, your best example of Christian behavior. This guy, being a steward, he was otherwise than this, was kind of a lousy king. And his kids were totally worthless. His son Charles lost his head because he was so worthless, got beheaded. But, but uh, uh, James, I, of the Stuart kings, of which there were four, uh, well, five if you count Anne, uh, so six, five, um, of the Stuart kings and queens, uh, James was the best. Uh, and she started out good, but then she wound up about 200 pounds and never took a bath. And it got to be so you couldn't be in the same room with her because she really stunk. And all her teeth fell out because she was a big candy fiend. She was a mess. Yeah, she, she, was, she was really a mess. All right, questions on King James Bible? Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. I immediately kind of thought about, you know, simplified means the image of Jesus and so, you know, dull, the, you know, right. little, little idolatry, right? Right, right. Right, right. Nothing really, um, you know, you know and, and even, even, even in short stuff, you've got children, you've got, you know, allegedly rights, I think one part of the whole, you know, sound is here that. Right, right. It's in Austria now. Yeah. Yeah. But there's nothing like really that says abound, like for Lutheran, you know, Luther's will. That wrote the There hasn't really been anything that right. I mean, you know, there are there are people, and there are a lot of pastors who make a pilgrimage uh, to Germany and they go to the Wittenberg, you know, castle church to see where the 95 theses were supposedly posted. They really weren't, but anyway. Uh, they like to go to the, the Wartburg and see the table that, that Luther, you know, did the uh, translation of the Bible on or whatever. Uh, they go to Marburg. The table that Luther got so mad at, at uh, Zwingli, he was debating Zwingli on the Lord's Supper, and, and finally he got so mad, everybody, of course, wore daggers in those days, just like most, a lot of people wear guns today. Anyway, and he pulled out his dagger and it looked like he was going to attack Zwingli, and he carved three letters in the table. I-S-T, ist, is. Yeah, right. And he stormed away. He told Zwingli, you are of a different spirit. You will not accept what God's word clearly teaches, and he left. And so that table survived all these centuries. And so you can go to Marburg, and you can go to the castle at Marburg and you can actually see the table that they sat at and see the letters that are carved in, in the wood. So, yeah, people do that, but yeah, it's not the same. <laughs> it, it's not the same. It, it's like, and you have to understand, you know, in, again, in Roman, in Roman theology, 
just visiting Rome itself, you know, buys you or gets you uh, a, a, an indulgence. And if you visit Rome during a jubilee year, for example, either a silver year, jubilee year or a golden jubilee year, uh, and you pass through a particular door in the Vatican, a door that goes nowhere, by the way. It's, it, it's a door in a wall, and you can go around the door. Okay? But, but when the Pope comes up to this door, he has a silver hammer. You know, ever heard Maxwell's silver hammer? <laughs> anyway, he, he has a silver hammer, and he hammers three times on this door, and they open the door, and then pilgrims who go to Rome, and you walk through this door that goes nowhere, but you just walk through it, you get a, 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 an indulgence. You get a certain number of years in purgatory paid off, see? Uh, and and, and if, in, in Luther's church, remember I told you when we were studying Lutheranism, in Wittenberg had the most relics of any church in Germany. And just visiting the church, just walking up and down the tables, gave you an indulgence. Yeah, just looking at them gave you an indulgence. See? And so this is, this is set in the minds of uh, Roman people, is that doing these kinds of things, looking at historical things, looking at the Shroud of Turin, looking at the spear, um, there's a name for it, I can't think what it is, but, but the pieces of the cross that are in uh, play, uh, the bones of St. James in Compostela, uh, Spain, okay? All of these things are considered good works. They're considered, they're considered uh, blessings to you. you. You do this, you get a blessing, okay? So obviously, uh, if, if you're convinced finally that, that that's no good, but then somebody comes along and tells you, yeah, but making a decision for Jesus or getting immersed or, you know, those kinds of things or giving up booze, right? Especially if you're Hispanic, right? Think about it. No more cerveza, right? That's a good work, see? And so, see, what, what's happened is you, you've got, you've, you've got uh, okay, here, here's, the, here's the Romans. Uh, and, and here's the Reformed, uh, Calvinist, uh, uh, Charismatic, pro, uh, uh, whatever. And, and here's the Lutherans in the middle, okay? And, and so over here, you've got all these things that you can do. Man, tons of stuff that you can do, right? And you get credit. You get blessings for them. And over here, there's all kinds of stuff that you can do. Right? You can give up this, you can give up that, you can no more baile, you know, no more, no more down, dancing, you know. Uh, you know, I, there's all kinds of stuff you can do, right? And, and your exuberance is measured. Oh, you know, do you, do you do this or do you just sit there like a lump? I guarantee you, sit there like a lump, people are going to point at you. Oh, what's the matter with that guy? How come that guy's not praying? Okay? I know, because my daughter-in-law goes to one of those churches, and yeah, she says, if you don't, if you don't stand up and, and shout and say hallelujah and praise the Lord and do this kind of stuff, people, okay? so there's all kinds of stuff that you can do over here. There's nothing you can do. You're saved by grace without the works of the law. And that's what we tell people, that's what we teach them, and they just go, eh, that's kind of boring. Of course, it doesn't mean that you don't do good works. Of course you do. But you've got to admit, folks, I mean, how many times have you gone to a Lutheran church and, and listened to a sermon and heard all about do this and do that and don't do this and don't do this and blah, 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 blah. I mean, how many times have you heard a, a massive sermon on good works in a Lutheran service? Almost never, right? Almost never. So, so especially if you're a culture, that, that is bound up in doing, right? In taking an active part, getting, getting involved, right? Being, being involved, getting in there, jumping in there with both feet, okay? Which is lots of cultures, by the way, not just Hispanic culture, but lots of cultures. If, if you're that kind of culture, Irish culture, Scottish culture, okay? German culture even, okay? French culture, Spanish culture, Italian culture. Okay? Greek culture, if you're in those, Russian culture, if you're in that kind of culture, you're going to do this or you're going to do this. And very likely, you're not going to do that. Just 
That's just the way it is. And it's as plain as the noses on your faces. But you try telling that to our missionaries. Hey, what do you know, Spen? You don't know anything. Shut up. You're crazy. But, I mean, if you know human nature, right, and you're a Celt, and you grew up around Mexicans, you understand this. You know what this is about. And you know it's really tough. I, we had a family in our Lutheran church, Missouri Synod Church in Yuma, the Chavez family, and oh man, did they take it on the chin from their relatives. They had Pentecostal relatives and they had Roman relatives, and man, they got it from both sides. The only time they ever got along was New Year's Day. Because uh, um, Hilda, not Hilda, Olivia, Olivia Chavez, made the absolute best menudo in the world. And Pasoli and Machaca. And, and so everybody would show up at, at uh, Olivia's house and, and Eddie's house for, for, uh, to get over their hangover, you know, get over the last night, you know. Uh, uh, and and uh, they got along that day. But that was about the only day that they got along. <laughs> All right, real quick, uh, five minutes. Uh, for the next century, through the reigns of James I and Charles I and culminating in the English Civil War and the protectorate of Oliver Cromwell, there were significant swings back and forth between two factions, the Puritans and Attic radicals. And again, the Lutheran Reformation was not a radical reformation. Calvin's Reformation, Ar Ar Arminius's Reformation, uh, Zwingli's Reformation, uh, the Reformation of John Knox uh, was radical because they are radically, it's like, it's like if, you got, if you got a little spot of cancer in your lungs, or maybe even one lung is bad, you take out that one lung. Okay? That's conservative. Those guys were radical. Take out both of them. Put you on a heart-lung machine forever. Okay? That's the difference. Um, uh, who sought more far-reaching reform in the church and the more conservative churchmen who aimed at keeping closer to traditional beliefs and practices. The failure of political and ecclesiastical authorities to submit to Puritan demands for more excessive reform was one of the causes of open warfare. The Puritans got more and more and more powerful because part of the reason was because the conservatives, the, the, the traditionalists, were corrupt. And it didn't take a, a genius to see the corruption. And so the Puritans, while they objected to religious uh, teachings, they mostly objected to the lifestyle of the traditionalists because it was a corrupt, unchristian, unbiblical lifestyle. So the traditionalists uh, really uh, uh, earned their uh, defeat. They, 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 uh, they earned it. They, they really did. Uh, by the standards of the European mainland, the level of violence over religion was not nearly as high compared to the Thirty Years' War. But casualties included a king, Charles I, and an archbishop of Canterbury, William Loud, both of her, whom were beheaded. So it was violent. The battles between what was called the Roundheads, the Roundheads were the Puritans, and the Cavaliers were the traditionalists. Uh, cavaliers, think of them as uh, uh, knights type of people, uh, upper class, lords, dukes, and all those kind of guys. Uh, and the roundheads, think of them as the lower classes or middle classes, the, the shopkeepers, uh, that kind of thing. And so it, it was a class of warfare, it was religious warfare, it was uh, political warfare. It was all kinds of things. If Charles had not disbanded Parliament as often as he did and send them home, it would be like the President of the United States saying, you know what, uh, I'm tired of dealing with you guys. I disband you. Go into Congress and say, I disband you. You all go home. You bring in the National Guard, escort them all to their cars, leave. I'm going to run this place all by myself because you guys, I can't trust you guys to do nothing. That's, that's what it would be like. Imagine, imagine that. Okay? 
I mean, some of us probably think it would be a good idea, and, you know, but, but imagine that happening. I mean, right? If he hadn't have done that, he probably would have survived. But doing that, that that's treason. That, that was treason, and so he could have his head cut off for that. And that's what happened. Under the protectorate of the Commonwealth of England from 1649 to 1660, Anglicanism was disestablished. So now, you know, for a while it was the Protestants who were, who were being attacked, and then it was the Romans who were being attacked. Now it's the Anglicans, the middle class, the middle group that's being attacked. Presbyterian ecclesiology was introduced as an adjunct to the Episcopal system. The 39 articles were replaced with the Westminster Confession, and the Book of Common Prayer was replaced by the Directory of Public Worship. How would you like that? How would you like if Washington, D.C. came up with a Directory of Public Worship? And every church in the country, no matter what its theology, every church in the country had to worship according to the Directory. That's what, that's what it was. It didn't matter if you leaned Lutheran or leaned Roman or leaned Luth uh, 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 Anglican or leaned whatever. Every church had to, for 10, 11 years, every church had to worship the exact same way. Yeah, or you had to do it in private, sneaky around, you know, without anybody letting let, let know what's going on. Um, despite this, about one quarter of English clergy refused to conform. So about a fourth of the, uh, about a third of the, uh, uh, or a fourth of the uh, uh, English clergy said, no, we're going to remain Anglican or Roman or whatever we are. Okay, we'll pick it up there next week. Let's close. May the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with us all. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.